couple other fun things to note. So I am the HPC Systems Manager, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, my boss is in the room, I met Majumdar. He was worked with DK Panda a lot and leads a lot of efforts around science gateways. Um, but as of in about a week, um, did that slide advance? Yeah. Uh, in about a week, I'll be going to work for Globus. What? So. What? Yeah. Uh, sorry, not a week. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> You're making this announcement here first time? No, no, no. In about two weeks. In about two weeks. Uh, I'll be going to work for the University of Chicago uh, on Globus. And uh, one of the best parts about working in Chicago is living in San Diego. So I'm not moving. <laughs> We're happy about that. Um, anyways, the topic of today's talk, HPC virtualization. This is about um, how to control your stack. This is an issue that we've had to de deal with quite a bit in HPC is the fact that people don't always fit within the one size fits many environment that we build. And there's a lot of user support time, there's a lot of packaging of applications moving them. So we've got a solution, I'm actually gonna talk about two of them, um, the primary one being virtualization. So briefly about Comet, uh, Comet's amazing. It's a totally great system. All the other systems are stupid. You should totally use Comet. No. Um, so uh, Comet is an NSF funded system that was driven by the NSF's realization <coughs> that we needed to have more diversity. Uh, there is certainly a high need for exascale and petascale systems and applications, but science is not driven alone by that. And as people develop more applications and come online and become computational scientists, if you think about biology and sociology and history and economics and all these fields that are leveraging computers more and more, uh, across the NSF directorates also, you know, we call that the long tail of science, and Comet is targeted at that. We still support a traditional HPC workload, but we also strive to bring in new communities. And so Comet's designed around the concept of access out to other campuses, leveraging our high performance networks via Scenic and Pathway, and then out to Internet2 and Exceed and stuff like that. Um, and a bunch of powerful storage systems that are very flexible that we have within the center. Um, so one of the key parts of the design though is that when we looked at the NSF job mix, the uh, size of the jobs were approximately 50% of the service units, the core hours, were at 2,000 cores or less, right? So as you think about the computer time used within the NSF funded community, most of them, or 50% of them, will fit within a single rack in terms of time. That's also 99% of the jobs, because a lot of those jobs are very small. So Comet is designed with a rack level factory and a four to one over subscription throughout the cluster, primarily for data access. So we target modest scale jobs that still accommodates a wide range of users. Uh, log of memory on the nodes, 128 gigabytes. We do a lot of shared node applications. A lot of people need single core. We give them single core, and we can pack quite a few of them in there. A lot of people need large memory for uh, that weak scaling, right, where you want to run a big domain simulation. Uh, so we, we can help with that as well. So about 2,000 compute nodes, some GPU nodes. Those GPU nodes are way more popular than we predicted um, back when we first built the system. Uh, they're heavily uh, oversubscribed. It's just we, we didn't realize when we were designing it how well NVIDIA would do at getting application developers to CUDA enable applications. Uh, this is, I think, the way NVIDIA has excelled. Um, and we also have some large memory nodes because sometimes you need to run a big data set, but you can't uh, distribute or parallelize your code in distributed memory. Science gateways the web portals and data portals that enable researchers to focus on their research and not know about the back-end systems. We have a strong push with science gateways. Amit leads the neuroscience gateway. Uh, we have the Cypress gateway. And um, Nancy Wilkins Deer is a co-PI on Comet and a co-PI of Exceed. And she has pushed heavily um, on gateways. So for those of you who want to help scientists not think about HPC but still be able to take advantage of it, that's the concept out there for you to leverage. And then what are we here to talk about today? Uh, virtual clusters. So this is the idea of using virtualization to enable people to bring their own stack and to find their own stack in HPC. Uh, yeah, we can skip that. All right, so virtual clusters, just to briefly mention, uh, it's not just us at SDSC, Indiana University, 
via uh, Gregor von Lezhevsky and Fu Yang Wang, who had a lot of experience with Future Grid, uh, are helping out with this. They came to us with a tool that allows people to do, that I'll talk about, um, to connect various clouds. All right, so what is the goal? Why do we want virtual clusters? Well, what you want is bare metal. You know, if you think about folks like Karen and I um, and our teams, these people, when they go to build clusters, they know how to work with bare metal. You hand us a rack, we give you a cluster, all right? And the tools that we use uh, also expect bare metal. Rocks, XCAT, OpenStack, at some point it expects bare metal. Um, so that's for the management. Also in performance, we want it to act like bare metal. As uh, Professor Panda mentioned, you know, we want this to be HPC. We don't want significant overhead. It would be wasteful. So this has to act like bare metal, both at the systems management level and in terms of performance. Okay. So the thing about that, though, is it adds a burden. It's a lot more work. So who is this appropriate for? Your typical user that is just learning the command line is not also going to want to manage a Linux cluster. Let me tell you, let me assure you of that. What they want is to have somebody build it for them. And that's very likely because I am not alone in being able to build and manage Linux clusters. Most of you come from universities or labs or other places, and you have the skills organic hero organization. Those folks can build Linux clusters. And the question is, why can't they leverage a resource that's housed somewhere else? And so this gives them the ability to burst, or maybe you've got um, you know, example.edu keeps getting pestered by some department because they want TensorFlow on an Ubuntu cluster. Well, example.edu can build out their Ubuntu cluster on our system and get TensorFlow trivially without needing to have a separate set of their hardware that they only use once a week for the person who's badgering them about TensorFlow. So that's a campus bursting type example. All right. So what enables this? Well, again, uh, Professor Panda mentioned this repeatedly, SRIOV, Single Root IO Virtualization. This is where we get our performance from. The idea of SRIOV is you have a physical adapter. Um, in this case, we're primarily talking about Mellanox's HCAs on the Infinity <coughs> side. It has a physical function. It does something. Well, what we want is to not have to abstract it if you look at the <coughs> traditional way of doing it within the hypervisor, there's a virtual switch. It's a software layer that basically has to handle every packet. So now you're going through the processor for every piece of data that's going through and going in and out of memory. The whole point of remote direct memory access is to not do that. So via SRIOV, you have virtual functions that go around the hypervisor and allow you to use registers on the device to talk to mapped memory within the virtual machine. So you cut out an, a software abstraction layer. It is direct RDMA between a virtual machine and some other HCA. That can be another physical machine. It can be another virtual machine. In this case, we're primarily talking about virtual machines, but it could also be storage devices. It could be out to your bridge going to Lustre or your LNET routers, whatever is appropriate. So does it work? It works really, really well. Um, this one right here is bandwidth, uh, and we got a little thing here that we argued about for about two weeks, but pretty much blue is native and red is virtualized, and it's small packet size and a large packet size, the bandwidth is you know, trivially the same. It just absolutely pushes packets. This is some tests we did on QDR a while ago. Latency, this is an old test, but there is an impact at latency at small message size. And we've gotten better at reducing this. The primary cause of this has nothing to do with SRIOV and has more to do with the virtual machine itself and the jitter caused by the hypervisor occasionally switching context um, and stuff like that. As we've gotten better at pinning processes, this has gone away, or at least gotten better. It's still, there might be a factor of about 20% and there's a dispersion at low message latency. Okay, so there's the abstract tests um, in terms of latency and bandwidth. What about real applications? So this is WRF, uh, similar to Cosmo, which we heard about. And it's a weather modeling code. And I love these slides because I just keep crossing out the initial numbers and putting in the new numbers. So this is a comparison between native IB, SRIOV, and EC2. And there is a huge difference between those. Currently, the difference between IB and SRIOV uh, is 2% on the virtualized side. And EC2 suffers 
because they use TCP and they use Ethernet and they also don't pack jobs um, for efficiency, right? EC2 is a cloud designed for a shared nothing architecture. It is not designed around HPC and shared no parallelism. Um, by the way, a comment about how we do SROV versus what uh, Dr. Panda talked about with um, virtualization. In our case, we allocate the whole node to the virtual machine. We hand over 120 gigabytes. So we're actually using standard and batch here because we don't need to take advantage of the ability to be context aware and to know that I have two VMs on the same machine, which is the key feature of the virtualization uh, parts of Mbappage 2. If you had multiple VMs on a single machine, you don't want to go out to the network if you don't have to. And so the new version of Mbappage 2 avoids that. Because our model is whole machine, users can just install whatever MPI they want, but we happen to like Mbappage 2, so all our tests use that. Quantum Espresso, which is a conjugate gradient code, has a lot of barriers, um, a lot of latency. We're down to 8%. So this is the worst case, right? Total control of your software stack for 8% latency um, on an extremely uh, latency sensitive code, or 8% performance hit. And EC2, because of that um, latency sensitivity, is off the charts, right? So this is where we, I think we will see cloud providers like Azure provides RDMA access um, and SROV, uh, they will start to come into this space if there is a market for it. So this is kind of some bare metal tests that uh, we did when we were spinning things up and then we kept testing as Comic got accepted and things like that. So, uh, like, okay. So what other tools do we use uh, to build this? Because we, we like to, everyone likes to do their own thing. We didn't want to use OpenStack. We had to do stuff our own way. Um, we've got an existing tool called Rocks that does systems management. We basically leveraged this and added a few things on top of it. So on the hardware side, we have SROV and we use KVM, for those of you familiar with hypervisors, KVMs, the de facto uh, in the open source Linux community. Disk images. The, you know, that file that defines the state of your virtual machine, we've got a fancy layer that migrates disk images around between storage and compute nodes. We use VLANs to isolate traffic uh, on the Ethernet side, so the management connection for a virtual cluster is isolated so that VMs don't see each other. Um, and then we use PKeys and uh, InfiniBand partitions to do the same for InfiniBand traffic to make sure that your virtual cluster is contained and that there is isolation on the network. We wrote a tool called Nucleus that basically sits outside of our existing tools and negotiates everything and drives it. <coughs> and the Indiana team brought us the client, which is CloudMesh. I'll show you that in a second. So let's do some lines and boxes. This is the front end that manages uh, our entire system. This is a box that hosts the front ends or management servers for the virtual cluster. And a virtual cluster consists of a virtual front end and virtual compute nodes running on top of the existing compute nodes of Comet. This is a key point, is we didn't create a separate portion of Comet. We have one Comet, and it runs jobs all the time. Some of those jobs are virtual machines. And we just use Slurm as a scheduler. We don't have a separate scheduler. Slurm's a great scheduler. And then we do our VLAN magic to isolate traffic and we move disk images around, et cetera. And what this means is we can have multiple virtual machines and multiple jobs running uh, on the same resource. So the resource utilization remains high because we haven't chopped it up into pieces. For those of you that have administered a cluster, this is what your virtual cluster would look like to you. You probably have a laptop, you probably use Wi-Fi, and there's cat videos out here. So you would talk via a client to Nucleus, uh, our management service and ask for things like spinning up and turning on your front end. And it has a host name, it has a public IP address, and then it's got a private ethernet network internal to you that you can assign IP addresses on, do whatever you want with, and you got some compute nodes, and you could do some home directory mounts, you could potentially access storage externally, and you've got a private InfiniBand network that you can also access. So. If you know what a cluster looks like, the virtual cluster looks very familiar to you. This is what I meant about people who manage clusters can easily build these. How do you gain access to one uh, and manage it? 
we have a REST API that for Nucleus, it's a REST API. Only it's about one one hundredth of the size of EC2s because we don't have to support all the same features. You know, our use case is power on a node, attach an ISO to the CD-ROM drive of a node, um, power off a node, request for a node to be booted, stuff like that. We don't have to have all the complexities like Amazon because we're, we focused it on a single set. So you could write your own code and talk to the REST API, um, or you can come in via Cloud Mesh, uh, the, cloud, the command line interface, which can also be scripted. And of course, there's console access to your nodes. So if your uh, bootloader is hosed and you want to work on it, it's really nice if you can get on the console, power cycle the node, and then actually fix it. So we're trying to know what the discrepancies or kind of pain points are with other cloud systems. This is what the console interface looks like on a plane. Um, it looks the same as you're sitting at the desk. Um, it's basically HTML5 and a socket via tool called Guacamole. So uh, we use this at the Exceed conference when they were going off about Jetstream and using an iPad. I'm like, that's great, um, but can you do it on a plane? So. Cloud Mesh, I want to touch on this. For those of you that are using cloud systems, this is a tool, the one that's developed by Indiana, and what Cloud Mesh does is it allows you to integrate different resources. The big trick about Cloud Mesh is it tries to provide you with similar semantics for every system that you're working with. Um, and that means that you can leverage things in a similar manner to, manner to get compute in various places. Uh, you can also take advantage of different types of platforms. So if you need a big data platform, if you need an HPC platform, Cloud Mesh tries to make that easy for you. This is what it looks like. If you say, I'm going to talk to Comet, and I want to boot something, you say boot. Um, if you want to switch over to Chameleon, uh, you say Chameleon, and then you say boot. So there's a few tools out there like this. And like if you are jumping between various cloud things and booting things up and doing stuff, check out Cloud Mesh. Um, there's a couple others presented at Exceed. Um, Um, so, yeah, so I recommend this uh, if you're testing out Amazon and other things, rather than having to learn um, four different tools, try to have one tool and they'll do the work for you. So what else can we do with Cloud Mesh and Comet? Well, because we're using ZFS on the back end for disk image management, it means that we can kind of trivially replicate the disk images that we have. And so we're going to make custom launchers. We know that people want particular types of clusters, um, Hadoop, Phoenix, TensorFlow, uh, you know, a bunch of others. Why not have us build a template of a roughed out cluster, say like a basic Ubuntu cluster or something, and then say, hey, you don't have to build the initial version, kind of like you could use an existing image. Why don't you take the, the template, we'll have a script that will clone the disk images and set it up for you um, and assign the IP addresses, et cetera, and then you've got your Hadoop cluster. Um, and then, again, because we can trivially replicate the uh, disk images, you can have your bigger Hadoop cluster. So this is the, the next step. Okay. One of the first projects that we worked with was OSG, the Open Science Grid. For those of you not familiar with the OSG, they focus on high throughput computing using a tool called Condor. And Condor is really good at cycle scavenging and fault tolerance and job retries, et cetera, but it likes to take over the node. It's basically another resource manager. And if you're already running a resource manager like Torque or Slurm, you don't want Condor running on your node because it's going to try and schedule jobs. So usually what the Open Science Grid has to do to leverage other clusters is have a glide-in set up between here and here. If you want to use Comet or the other one, you've got to have a layer, an abstraction layer, that will basically take jobs and submit them to Comet, and then the job starts and it goes and pulls jobs off of the meta scheduler. So it's just more code to maintain. We gave OSG a virtual cluster, and they just built a pure Condor cluster tied into the meta scheduler with no additional software. It looked just like the one in their physics lab um, and their other 
tier two sites, and they manage it the same way. Their, their users, their namespace, their control. Um, and in this way, we get to scale. We get to work with one group that's highly skilled and talented, and then they get to support their hundreds to thousands of users. Um, and this is a big point about scaling support. It's like the science gateways. So I want to touch on some other things besides the technology. Um, and this is to get your minds thinking, especially those of you that administer systems or work with systems. What happens when you start talking about virtualization in a traditional HPC environment? Um, and one of the first one is control and responsibility, right? Normally, we maintain a cluster and everyone else that uses it works in user space. And we build our security models and policies around the assumption that you don't come out of user space. Um, if you do, we call that a vulnerability and we patch our system, right? And so we're very concerned about who has access to this, especially because a lot of our security models for storage and the network are tied to this. So SDSC has this concept of an outback network. Uh, if you want to have a server and maintain it yourself, we stick you in a special place on the network and you sign a form. And that form says, I will take care of my machine, and if I don't take care of my machine, you can shut it off and I'll, I'm responsible for it. Um, <coughs> this is what we're considering for virtual cluster administrators. So there is a point of contact and a principal investigator for managing the virtual cluster. We have their IP addresses isolated into a separate network, um, and we're going to have them sign a polite form that says, hey, just acknowledge that we're giving you a public IP address and a machine, right? And you could potentially do something naughty uh, or make a mistake or have it get hacked. And none, some of these things may not be your fault, but you are responsible. So I think that's one of the key points. The other, now, to be a little more positive, the thing I've just described about Comet is the utilization. By being co-scheduled within the batch system, uh, you get to do, uh, you get to use a variety of software in the same environment uh, without, like I said, having to partition the system. So what we have to do now is, how do people expect this to act like the cloud? Do they expect their VMs to boot right now, or do they understand that this is scheduled within a finite environment because I haven't been able to talk the NSF into giving me millions of dollars every month, right? If the NSF would allow us to grow based on utilization, we could scale infinitely. They're probably not. Um, I should have asked so when he was um, on, on the Skype. That would have been a good time. Uh, so maybe an eager grant every month for another rack. Um, could do that. So we can, all, but we have the scheduler, right? So we can tune it. We can potentially allocate a set of nodes um, and have them reserved for virtual clusters. Uh, and we can reserve nodes if people have periodic workloads and things like that. So this is stuff that we are just gonna have to learn as we go along and try to tune the system. Here's a big one, and that is training. So Karen sat in on the Exceed training and saw you know, that bu bu building a cluster um, on Comet is like building a cluster. The difference is we're dealing with the hardware, so if you have staff that you want to train on how to install and build uh, systems, configure networks, uh, things like that, I got a platform for you. And we can give you a set of nodes, and they can go to town, and we can tear it down afterwards, and they're not tying up a huge amount of resources, and you're not paying the power bill, and Generally speaking, a training session only lasts for a few hours, so it's an efficient use of resources. Um, you can try Ubuntu, you can test your deployments of different schedulers, you can test your different versions of code, stuff like that. So if you, if you want to do HPC training, then talk to me about Common. Uh, all right, and campus bursting. I hinted at this. This is where I think the big thing will happen with virtualization is their you know, resource utilization goes up and down. And a campus, no more than any other organization, can't afford to build for the maximum demand. They have to build for the average demand. Well, sometimes they've got special projects with bursty needs or custom environments. We have Exceed and the Campus uh, Champion program. Comet's an ideal fit for that. The Campus Champion can come in, build the cluster, and then allocate it to their users. If their users like it, they can get exceed startup allocation and keep running. So, and the campuses have the skilled staff to do this. So I think that 
campus bridging will be a very big use um, of virtualization in the future. All right, now I'm gonna do what I've done in my last two talks, where we go off the rails, and I spend all this time talking about virtualization, and then I wanna point out a new tool to you, um, and then everyone gets excited about it. Okay, so everyone keeps talking about Docker. I like containers, I want containers. When can I have containers? Why don't you put Docker on a new system? And those of us in HPC look back and say, Docker's not secure in an HPC environment because it runs as root and you have access to my network. Um, well, Greg Kurtzer from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab has solved the problem for us. Uh, he's built a tool called Singularity, and Singularity is containers in user space. Um, this is what you're looking for. Singularity allows you, the user, on your uh, Linux environment, your virtual machine, your laptop, whatever it is, to build a container, a file that is bootstrapped with everything but the Linux kernel. It then can be shipped to my systems and other systems as is and executed. On that system, there is a single application that runs primarily in user space, with one exception, um, to, that will boot or basically set up the namespace, ch root, bind mounts, et cetera, for your container. Yes, you can build a container on Ubuntu and send it to Comet and run it right now, uh, and Gordon, or TSEC. So you get application portability and reproducibility. This is huge. And that one exception is a single file um, that executes as a privileged user to set up the namespace is designed for easy review by security engineers. And so I went to my security engineer, I said, Scott, please look at this file. He looked at this file and he said, that looks good. Um, it's not a service. You call it within the batch script. So it works with my existing scheduler. I love it as a system administrator. So please take a look at this. If you need portability, et cetera, um, you want containers, you don't want to install your code everywhere you go or beg for help, there is a tool for this. Um, and it's a much better fit than Docker or Shifter or other things. There's no existing services, uh, there's no services, um, et cetera. This is a rough way of how it works with MPI. Uh, I used this to talk with Hari and DK um, when we were at Exceed to kind of motivate them, and they are looking at it because it's working with OpenMPI. Basically, the MPI libraries internally can use that PMI interface to get information to talk to the MPI tools externally. So you get native performance. There's no abstraction layers here. It's totally dependent on the application you deploy within the container. Now, with portability, if you build for a certain architecture, whether it's a GPU or AVX2, et cetera, you've got to run on that hardware. But if you targeted, say, AVX, you can be guaranteed to run on Sandy Bridge and above, and there is a lot of platforms out there that can support that. So that singularity uh, it is another mechanism to give you control over your software so that your environment is familiar to you, uh, et cetera. Thank you.